Good afternoon. We've got an interesting discussion ahead of us. Uh, sorry we started late, but we wanted to give a chance for as many people as possible to join us. It's been quite a interesting conference and uh, summit, I have to say. We've got quite uh, a lineup of distinguished uh, movers and shakers in the Egyptian uh, renewable energy arena. Um, if I may humbly start, uh, my name is Hadi Tahboub, uh, Vice President of uh, the Middle East Solar Industry Association, uh, where I vol I'm a volunteer uh, member representing uh, a corporate uh, entity, Sky Power Global. And uh, to my left, uh, we've got a friend in the industry and uh, a prominent name in the Egyptian renewable energy market, Mr. Sharif El Gabali. Managing Director of Inara Capital, an industrial and infrastructure project development platform operating across the MENA region, Middle East and Africa region. And it was interesting to get to know, mashallah, that uh, Sharif has aspirations in utilizing his experience in Egypt to tap into the GCC opportunities, including, inshallah, Abu Dhabi. Uh, to his left, we've got Mr. Kurt Neubayer. I hope I pronounced that correctly. The German way or the American way, either way. Neubauer. <laughs> <laughs> Neubauer. Uh, General Manager at uh, Sargent and Lundy. Uh, Mr. Neubauer has uh, over 25 years experience in engineering and consulting in the power generation industry. We cross paths many a times in uh, various summits, conferences, and even uh, projects. Uh, Sergeant Lundi is a global provider of engineering design and technical consulting services that's dedicated exclusively to the power industry. And uh, last but not least, uh, to his left, Mr. Faisal Isa, founder and partner at Solar Shams, a very interesting entity and uh, player in the Egyptian solar and wind energy sector, a uh, firm highly specialized in the field of wind and solar energy throughout the Middle East. And uh, we've got some prominent uh, attendees from uh, the Egyptian government as well, and we're very honored, Dr. Sobki, with your presence, and of course, our extended audience as well. Before we start, uh, I think it's part of also time management. You would all notice you've got those interesting uh, iPad gizmos on your chairs. If anyone has a question that he would like to ask, and I think this improves people being anonymous so that you could ask embarrassing questions <laughs> without raising your hands. Please tap in the uh, question and send it, and I'll keep refreshing my page, and I, if it pops up, I'll uh, send it. If we didn't uh, ask the question, please raise your hand. It might have not popped on my screen. Right. Uh, gentlemen, ever since we all crossed paths many times a year ago in Egypt, and roughly same time last year, the amazing landmark uh, Sharm el-Sheikh Economic Development Conference in Egypt, where we had a very tangible taste of the visions, the plans of the new Egypt that the whole Arab world looks to. Many goals have been set in place. And I tend to look at it as a springboard. That conference was a springboard. You jump high, but at the end, it's how you get into the water properly. So yes, there were a lot of, a lot of projects announced and whatnot, but I think this was more of a stimulus, a catalyst for telling the world, Egypt is ready, Egypt is fertile. Um, it's interesting to know that for the first time in a long time, last s uh, summer, Egypt, the Egyptian people celebrated not one power cut, which is quite a, an amazing achievement, not one power cut in the Republic of Egypt. And this just shows that we are ready. This just shows that behind the scenes, behind all those interesting uh, conferences and discussions and visits and trade delegations, a lot of homework is being done on the side to manage the demand, to manage the efficiency of the... Uh, like there, there's a number of programs that are done on different fronts. So I'd like, 
I'd like to ask Sharif, to start with Sharif, where are we today in terms of managing and handling the increasing demand for the world's most populous country, a country which has a major potential to keep on growing, to keep on investing in not just tourism, which is a very big component of the Egyptian economy, but as well industries and whatnot. Yeah, you know, Egypt, uh, yeah. first I confirm the sentiment, the, the facts on ground as we speak today. It's, it's, it's totally different than when at Sharm sheikh But we lived very uh, unstable four to five years after the revolution. There has been there has been fundamental and uh, uh, elemental changes in the economy of Egypt since. Uh, most of which your, your, your main uh, foreign currency sources have, have been dramatically uh, decreasing. Uh, mm -hmm. You're faced with geopolitical challenges. You're faced with uh, social challenges and you're faced with uh, economic challenges. Definitely, with this new state, with we today celebrating uh, uh, the three corners of our uh, um, uh, 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 democratic pillars, which is a parliament, which today has passed the unified electricity law mm -hmm. for and mm -hmm. Dunia may be on the panel before she was just explaining what, what was happening. So yeah, I see a very bright future. I'm, I see a promise, which is, which is, which is uh, maybe not with the same overwhelming, uh, you know, ambitious, dreamy uh, rainbow view we saw in Sharm el-Sheikh happening. However, there has been real, real progress on ground. We see a subsidy removal plan, which is again, the main trigger to have a real power industry in Egypt. We see a feed-in tariff, a very promising feed-in tariff program. We see a unified electricity law, which is meant to liberalize uh, an electricity market, buy and sell. There has been a lot of progress on the generation side. As you were saying, today we, we, we barely uh, witness any power cuts. There, there are bilateral and governmental uh, agreements to have the transmission uh, uh, infrastructure upgraded to uh, um, to uh, to maintain the new generation coming online. So yeah, there has been many aspects on the infrastructure. So I would say, just to, in a nutshell, what's being focused now from the state and from the government is to have a strong infrastructure that can accept investments uh, and. Uh, uh, and a, a more ease of framework and re mm -hmm. legislations which can uh, really maintain a fr an, an investment-friendly uh, environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. Speaking of the feed and tariff program, the notable fit program in Egypt, and with targets set at 20% renewable energy by 2020, one of, there's a number of schemes, power scheme, feed and tariff schemes. Everyone was rushing to the 2000 megawatt, but we never hear of anything happening or anyone raising discussions on the 300 megawatt. So that kind of like calls into question what's the potential of not just that, but the rooftop solar potential in, in Egypt. Could you comment on that, Sharif? Well, you know, the, the problem with the, with, the, with the rooftop scheme and the small scheme is that it hasn't been designed with the same um, uh, incentives we see at least on the, on the utility scale scheme. The utility scale scheme is correlated with a dollar, mm -hmm. so it's more structured in terms of, of, of modeling and easier to finance, specifically with DFIs. On the small rooftop, it's, it's, it's fixed, it's, it's EGP based. It's not that attractive. It would be more of, a, of luxury, you know, uh, or more of marketing uh, demand side than a real economic model where you can have, you know, uh, uh, 
<coughs> supply demand structure. Uh, I believe Faisal uh, Solar Shams are one of the players on, on, on this rooftop market, and, uh, and uh, I guess he can, more, he can elaborate mm -hmm. further on this. But as far as we've seen, no, there, there is no real demand. Uh, definitely we need more local banks involved with, with preferential interest rates, with more structured finance, at least for this scheme, mm -hmm. so in order to have this up and running. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, before we move to our next distinguished speaker, for those who have join, just joined us in the audience, uh, you could use your, the iPads on your seats for typing up questions, and upon pressing send, it'll reach me directly, hopefully. If I did not address a question, raise your hand, it might have not reached me. Um, moving quickly to Faisal, how do you view the growth curve in, in Egypt for rooftop solar, in parallel with managing the demand. I mean, we celebrated so far, knock on wood, alhamdulillah, a year of no power cuts, and that, that is something worth being proud of in Egypt. And as a prominent player in the rooftop solar industry, are we on a good, stable uphill curve, or are there still challenges ahead of us? Uh, first of all, thank you, of course, for inviting me to be on this panel uh, today, and uh, it's an honor to be um, trying to give a, a little bit of a view about what's happening in Egypt, and specifically on the demand side. Uh, before I answer the question, it's really important to think about uh, renewable energies in general. It's not only solar PV, there is solar uh, thermal, also very high potential, there is wind and there is other things. But specifically for, uh, for rooftop, we, we just have to, first of all, start from the, from the base that what happened in Egypt in the last year is, is an achievement. And we have to start from that base, whether it's um, on the announcement of an increasing um, energy prices. This is something that we have been uh, calling for quite a long time, that we need to remove the subsidies on the energy. Now we have a clear plan for the next five years that uh, where the energy prices are going. Uh, we have the introduction of the solar feed-in tariff, as Sharif has said, and also on the, on the smaller scale projects on the rooftop. And we have other schemes which is specific for some industries. We have uh, schemes for tourism, you have uh, some schemes for financing solar water heaters, we're working with Nerea on this. So uh, as far as the rooftop comes, um, I personally think this is the real growth potential for the market. Today we're focusing on Big projects, that's okay. Of course, we need it. We're a, we're a, we're a nation that was hungry for, for megawatt. Let's put it this way. And after uh, the, the development which is taking place now on the 50 megawatts, um, I think the real growth potential is coming from the smaller and distributed generation, whether it's rooftop or still ground mounted. Um, on the 300 megawatt, uh, yes, there is a, a potential. Yes, there is a, a, a typical scheme for it. But we need to think a little bit more about um, specifics that will help such small industry to move on. Things like financing schemes <coughs> specified for rooftop, um, maybe thinking a little bit about the, um, about the tariff compared to the bigger tariff again, because we, we know that on the bigger scale projects, the tariff is actually higher than the smaller scale, which is mm -hmm. different from many countries mm -hmm. in the world. Mm -hmm. So such um, supporting schemes, I would call it, to help the main program to move on, would definitely help the 300 megawatt to move on. Such supporting schemes. Well, as, as a, pl a leading player in the industry, like many other companies in Egypt, what would you say would be an, the first incentive to jump into or to promote an encouraging scheme for rooftop solar developers, from houses to hospitals to touristic insta facilities, to boost, start boosting this wave of rooftop solar development potential? Uh, that's a very nice question. So, Because <laughs> in, in and certain I, and I Turkey, would be in Dubai, we've seen D was the driver, but in Egypt, is it players like yourselves, like yeah. Inara Capital and others, or? I, I would say, I would focus on, on main three things. The one thing which will take time, we all don't have control on it, which is the increase of the prices of mm -hmm. the conventional mm -hmm. energy. This is taking place, it's on the go, but as soon as we come closer to the cost of renewables, then things will change. That's number one. Number two, what we can do right now, and I think we, what we really need in Egypt is specific financial schemes for such projects. Mm -hmm. um, with the announcement of the tariff, there was a scheme that was supposed to be taking place in Egypt financing smaller size projects. It's not yet um, operational, and I think when it's operational or similar schemes, things will take off. Mm -hmm. So this is the second dimension. And 
Personally, I believe the third dimension would come from a real emphasis on standards and quality, because then when you don't have any control on the standards and quality on such specific small projects, you would find anyone, everybody uh, supplying systems. And maybe it's not very good for, for, for the country and the general impression about solar energy, mm -hmm. because then people would say, ah, so it doesn't work, it's expensive or it's cheap or whatever. So putting the proper standards, putting financing, and coming closer to the real cost with respect to the energy, I think that's uh, something will push the industry forward. Before we move to Kurt about standards and quality, can I ask the audience a show of hands, how many of you knew that the very first solar and full scale solar energy plant was developed? The first one around the world was established in Egypt in the 1920s? Yes. How many knew that? In? 1918. Was a solar thermal 18. plant. Well, I, I see only the Egyptians knew that. <laughs> <laughs> it it's, uh, it uh, was established by a pioneering American in uh, Maadi, an, an area which I really love to take long walks at. And, and actually, it's interesting. An American set it up there, and there's a, a popular uh, American diner as well there. <laughs> so moving to our American colleague, uh, Kurt, when it comes to managing the demand side and the, the, the load in Egypt, and now that we've got, we're celebrating a one year, mashallah, of uh, no power cuts, what would you say from your immense uh, consulting background on the subject? Well, thank you, Hadi. Um, I guess uh, your very interesting comment about the, uh, the um, the, the old solar plant is actually a very interesting point that I wanted to make, and that is that Egypt has been around for a very long time. It's a very capable nation. Uh, it's shown many times in the past a, a, a real ability to uh, develop technologies, to, to implement schemes, to, uh, to improve uh, and, and meet its own needs. And, it, and what's happened since Sharm el-Sheikh is really a, a strong indication that that can still continue to happen. Um, to see the development, the very large-scale development of simple cycle plants, gas-fired plants, which are now going to be converted to much more efficient c combined cycle, but to meet the needs and the demands quickly, uh, to at the same time institute programs and uh, for coal-fired plants, which uh, my company is involved with, and also for these uh, renewable things all at the same time, to see it all work at the same time is really quite amazing. So I think it's a, it's a great example to, uh, for the rest of the world to look at, especially developing world, part of, parts of the world. Now, um, our discussion today is about demand-side management, which has a very broad uh, set of definitions. It's, it's, uh, it can be used as a term to, uh, to cover an awful lot of things, but uh, in the one case here, we, we were first looking at demand-side management or just demand management from the point of view of meeting the demand period, but we're past that in Egypt now. So now we uh, probably start looking at industrial demand. Uh, your, your, your lowest hanging fruit generally is very large-scale industrial demand. Uh, it's moving that demand to different parts of, the, uh, parts of the day, different time frames, so that peak demands can be shaved. Uh, and that uh, additional generation capacity isn't needed so quickly uh, because you're shifting the demand around. So I think that's clearly one of the, one of the first steps and probably the lowest hanging fruit that, uh, that Egypt could look at. Another aspect then is, uh, is instituting uh, self-generation and energy efficiency again within the industrial in, uh, environment uh, to, to go to homes, to go to uh, to small commercial uh, establishments and expect much of a, of a, of a gain from, from efficiency improvements uh, is, is sometimes a little bit longer road to go down. So to go to your industrial clients and customers and seek that. And one thing that I was making a point to you before is that a lot of times in our experience what we've seen is that industries who, who take that uh, take that initiative and own that project to either improve their efficiency or to, uh, or to become a self-generator. And they really own that business case, they own the model, they own the, the benefits of it themselves. Then they can incorporate it into their operations and make it much more successful. Uh, we're seeing that here in Abu Dhabi and Dubai through Emirates Global Aluminum, uh, obviously a very large user of electricity. Uh, a large self-generator of electricity, but they don't just stop with what they have. They continually want to make it more efficient 
and to improve the cost uh, aspects of it. You've uh, reflected, mirrored a lot of points that reflect the growing industrial potential in what you just said, Kurt. Mm -hmm. um, I've noticed over the course of the last year and through various conferences, various industrial organizations that operate between the GCC, Jordan, and Egypt. Let us say, for example, uh, a major industrial group that operates warehouses and facilities, uh, if they adopted, say, rooftop solar in their Jabal Ali facilities, they're duplicating it in Jordan and duplicating it in their Egyptian facilities. And we are witnessing here an awakening giant, a new economy of renewable energy where there are no borders. I mean, Sharif, yourself, you're, you're, you're based in Egypt and now you're uh, keep, keeping your radar switched on for opportunities in the UAE. And clearly, what, at the end of the day, it's the same technology, the world's simple, most simple form of generating power. Um, I think that the next big thing is going to be industrial demands. That's going to be a major factor for large-scale rooftop solar uh, <coughs> projects. Um, looks like this iPad facility is going to be quite a nuisance. I'm getting a lot of questions. <laughs> um, to Faisal, from the audience, what is the size of the rooftop solar market in Egypt? And where is the market forecasted to be in the next few years? Okay, so um, the tariff actually structure that we have today in Egypt um, makes two kind of uh, markets. We have the less than 500 kilowatt market, sort of, and then the big utility scale projects. So the rooftop projects are more or less limited to that, uh, to that capacity till now. Um, what we see sometimes, and I think this is something we are also discussing in, um, with, with Neria and with Egypt Terra to see how we can expand a little bit because in some industrial applications, it's not only a half a mega, it usually goes up to one or two megas. So we want to see how we can um, put a, a proper structure also for, for the feed-in tariff for this one. However, um, at this stage, what we could see, answering the second part of the question, the growth is definitely coming on the industrial, industrial uh, sector. And thank you very much for tapping on this demand side management. You have a lot of things to do. You could uh, use uh, smart meters, uh, you could use um, uh, time of use uh, tariffs, which I think also Egypt is studying at this, at this moment. I'm not, I'm not sure whether it's going to be applied soon or not. But uh, typically, um, the growth is in the industrial side and specifically with the plans that the country have for, for the next years for, for development. Um, this is a question that the audience mentioned, uh, a simple question, what are the solar energy targets? I know renewable energy target is 20% of total production by 2020. <laughs> Gentlemen, would you, do you have an indication on what are the specifically solar energy target from the uh, role? I believe we have Dr. Sopke here. Yeah, no, he can. <laughs> 40% out of the 20%, and that's very achievable for an, a country that enjoys good sunshine and very good solar irradiance. Um, are there any deals, this is another question from the audience, are there any deals being announced recently on renewables? And this is also a footnote from uh, another member of the audience. What's the next solid tangible step we are expecting in Egypt Again, we, we heard about a lot of uh, bilateral deals being uh, put in place, the feed-in tariff program, which includes a number of schemes, and we've got the recently announced tenders in Egypt. But where do we go from there? What is the solid, tangible platform that we're going to find Egypt steering towards? Sharif? Well, it's, it's going to be supply-demand again. It's a, it's, it's, we're a market economy. So what's being structured as we speak today is mostly we, we were under a firefighting mode for the last two years. We had to, we had to uh, meet a main uh, uh, necessity of generation. As far as I know and as far as I understand, as I see as well, is, is that there, the, 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 the fundamentals are there. We have a very strong industrial base. We have a very strong residential as well in, in terms mm -hmm. of markets. Uh, specifically on the industrial, we do have uh, diversified industries from high intensive energy consumption industries, steel, siemens, petrochemicals, uh, uh, 
etc., which, which represent a very lucrative market to tap in. You have big residential uh, uh, developments, mm -hmm. and most and foremost is that we are projected to grow. So, so with, with this growth, so definitely there shall be uh, demand. Thing is that we need, we need legislative frameworks, we need uh, structures to work accordingly. So, so I believe the main, the, the, the essence of a unified electricity law and in parallel removing subsidies, these are the two pillars you can build on a market. So no subsidies, a unified electricity law where you, you can sell and buy a liberal market, then definitely this means that there, there is a market coming up. A unified electricity, electricity law. law and removal of subsidies, which lead, takes me to the next question from the audience. With that in mind, are there any main geographical areas in Umm Dunya, yes. in Egypt, where we could expect a blooming of solar energy projects or renewable energy installations? I, I would assume it's the, 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 those master developments that we keep seeing a lot that are catering to incoming uh, Egyptians from the diaspora or Perhaps uh, the touristic areas, uh, Sharif, and then I'd like Faisal to comment on that. Okay, so according to, according to the government schemes we see today, uh, West Delta Minya would be the biggest uh, uh, producer of renewable energy. We're looking mm -hmm. at an eight gigawatt uh, okay. land uh, of plants. And Yes, definitely. There, yeah, tourism areas are usually in sunny areas, are usually in places where it's easier to install uh, solar. It's, and there has been some schemes, I believe, with the Ministry of Tourism and uh, Neria uh, being designed to give incentives for uh, hotels and, 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 mm -hmm. and uh, so they can uh, have some renewable projects in place. Uh, but specifically, it's going to follow developments. I mean, it's going to follow the usual economic development, you know. So in, mm -hmm. in uh, south of Egypt, there are many industries, uh, industrial zones designed. You have the economic, new economic zone, Suez Canal zone, for instance. So it would follow developments usually. Mm -hmm. yeah. Faisal, do you think uh, with that as well in mind, would we see a blooming of uh, also the wind energy in parallel? Yes, I was just going to comment on this. Thank you for, for mentioning it. Um, I think everybody is looking, um, the whole world, including ourselves, are looking forward to, for two things. As one, Bin Ban, with the 2,000 megawatt expectations. Of course, the biggest part of it is in Bin Ban. There is another part in Zafarana, and in the future also in the West and East Nile. And um, the second part with regards to the wind is in the Gulf of Suez area and Gabal Zayt. So this is the main two programs we have now, that's the utility scale projects, which is uh, directly um, uh, in, in cooperation with the government. And my own expectation, as Sharif said as well, when it comes to tourism, we have a specific program that is trying to take, uh, to take off um, specific areas, which is not on the grid. Uh, places like Marsa Alam, uh, like Al Wahat, uh, those are off-grid areas where hybrid solutions could work perfectly together. Mm -hmm. So this is the main focus in addition to the industrial facilities, wherever it is, I think this is where the main focus is now. Um, we've got, uh, we're approaching our time deadline, but I've got two questions from the audience. One of them made me giggle, to be honest, and maybe, Kurt, you could uh, answer no, oh, that. You would give me the phone. Um, and it, it's, I'd like to meet the guy who sent this question, <laughs> because we all talk about when are we going to sign deals? When are the Egyptians going to do this? When is DIWA going to announce that? But a member of the audience, bless him, mentioned, when will PV costs stop going down? It seems like the more we wait, the better deals we get. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good, uh, good buyer's position to be in, I guess. But uh, I think you have to be careful uh, as, you, as, a, as an industry like this um, matures and it, it involves a, a, not a new technology, but a technology that's changing rather uh, dramatically and, and allowing for cost to drop. You have to be very careful to watch for what is really truly a drop in cost <coughs> and what is actually a, a drop in quality or in capability of the equipment you're buying. Uh, PV plants are essentially nothing but equipment. Uh, and I can say that from my point of view because we're a power plant design organization. There's very little for us to design in a PV plant. It's, it's all in the equipment. 
And if you go uh, to that equipment manufacturer and you say, I want lower prices, I want lower prices, I want lower prices, well, guess what? They'll find a way to lower the prices, but they're not going to lose money. Uh, so we, we have to be careful as the industry moves forward not to expect a continuing fast drop in these prices without being very careful about the standards. We talked about standards. Uh, quality standards, uh, the ability of the, of the equipment to last for the utility grade time periods of 20 and 30 years, okay? So um, uh, they'll keep going down as long as the pressure's there, but there's a, there's a consummate cost to pay. And one last question from the audience. We have a new project for major power generation. Um, I mean, the Egyptian scene has different geographical uh, settings from water reservoirs, dams, canals, the Nile Valley, etc. Could we come, could we perceive or envisage upcoming novel technologies where we could connect water bodies or connect air currents through valleys to tap into the invention of new energy generation uh, uh, schemes? Uh, there's a lot of wind energy inventions, and there's, there's, it's like a Pandora's box. Uh, Faisal, do you think? from someone who's developing multimodal renewable energy schemes, you see a growing potential for new ideas in capturing renewable energy in Egypt. Yes, I think um, there is one untapped uh, part that we did not maybe talk about is bio. And um, as far as I understand, uh, Dr. Sokke could also confirm there is something should be coming soon in Egypt. Um, and uh, there is one, one, one more project or focus for the previous question that maybe I, I did not uh, comment on, there is a project in Gabon Atea now with, uh, with this, uh, hydro storage. So this is something that combines a new technology of using hydro in a, in a different way. So it's, um, it's used to pump water up a very high hill in Gabal Atea near mm -hmm. uh, in Sukhna. And then in peak demand, then you use the water to, uh, to uh, operate Drive turbines. Uh, hydro turbines. So this is a, a new way of utilizing hydro uh, potential in Egypt as well. I personally don't think that we're going to build another high dam. Um, there is no potential for that. But there is surely potential for such new ideas and, mm -hmm. and new inventions. Um, we've also looked at small hydro generation, specifically in the Nile. But I'm not sure if this is the correct time for it now. It's for sure a potential, and I think the whole world is also tapping on this opportunity everywhere. And with that, uh, I thank the distinguished uh, panelists for your interesting discussion, and thank you for the audience for participating. And with that note, I'd like to say onwards with Egypt, and thank you very much. <laughs>